Today, I will discuss a little known part of the history of World War II, which relates back to the Holocaust in a way, but actually has much more to do with Canada and England than with Germany proper. This is the story briefly of what happened to some 2,300 German and Austrian Jewish male refugees. For those unfamiliar with the story, it's actually quite shocking to see how England and then Canada uh, handled this. To be sure, the story is not what one expects, and in retrospect, the story makes very little sense, even in the context of war. Several years back, I had cause to watch a particularly intense testimony from 1994 that was quite fascinating on many levels, but one thing particularly caught my eye. The man, who was named Edgar S., was a German Jew with a sufficient number of international connections to be permitted under the Munich Agreement of 1938 to receive a travel visa to England. This occurred because in the Munich Agreement, Czechoslovakia was entitled to a certain number of transit visas, but because of the German occupation, the Czechs couldn't use all the visas, so the program was opened up to Jews from Germany and Austria. Before 1933, Edgar S. was a lawyer in Germany, but then the Nazis made it illegal for him to practice law. In any event, he took a course on acetylene welding, which helped him land a job as a metal worker in London. In the course of his testimony, Edgar mentions, just in passing, that he got help from a man in Berlin in getting him a job in London. The man's name was Dr. Paul Epstein. Epstein, of course, was an assistant of Rabbi Leo Beck, the renowned German theologian. In the course of his work, Dr. Epstein had visited England many times, arranging for kinder transports of thousands of youngsters from Nazi Germany to England between 1938 and 40. And of course, Epstein later became the second leader of the Theresienstadt ghetto. In the time leading up to World War II, England accepted around 70,000 Jewish refugees. With a job awaiting him and a valid visa, Edgar S. was successfully able to enter England on August 15, 1939, some two weeks before Hitler invaded Poland. Edgar had lived under the Nazis for many years prior to his departure and always had a kind of terror of what was going to happen next. For example, after being rounded up on Kristallnacht, he ended up spending six weeks in Dachau. At that moment, getting into England must have felt like winning the lottery. Sadly, although Edgar S. was investigated by an official tribunal and cleared of any suspicion of being a German spy, and was then permitted to integrate into British society for many months, world events then interceded and prevented Edgar from enjoying his newfound freedom. In May 1940, with the Nazi invasion of Holland, Belgium, and France, then British Prime Minister Churchill became fixated on the idea that there might be German spies scattered in amongst the Jewish refugees. Then a decision was made. As Edgar S. puts it, Australia and Canada were approached to help the motherland, and they agreed to accept prisoners of war and dangerous enemy aliens for safekeeping during the war. At that moment, all Italian, German, and Austrian refugees were referred to as enemy aliens, even including Jews who were seeking to escape the Nazis. In Edgar's case, he was first taken to be interned at Kempton Park Racecourse in Surrey, and was eventually transferred to the Isle of Man, which is an island in the Irish Sea. In June and July, it was decided that about 2,300 German and Austrian Jewish internees and a smaller number of German POWs were to be sent across the ocean to Canada. Four ships carried them, including the SS Duchess of York, the HMS Etrick, and the MS Sobieski. That's Edgar's ship. The last ship, the Arendoa Star, became significant because on July 2nd, 1940, a U-boat torpedoed her off the coast of Ireland with the loss of 805 souls. The British public were shocked and enraged and dismayed by this totally unnecessary maritime disaster. Churchill was excoriated in the press. Ultimately, Prime Minister Churchill relaxed his policy of internment and decided not to attempt to send further refugees across the ocean. In March 1941, 
most of the Jewish internees in England were released. Stunningly, though, those that reached Canadian shores, like Edgar S., were mostly held in internment camps for at least another year or two. Anyway, back in 1941, Edgar, on the MS Sobievsky, departed England on July 4th, 1940, and he arrived in Quebec City on July 15th, 1940. It was clear to Edgar and the other refugees that the Canadian Army had not really been informed who they actually were. The refugees were stunned that they were treated by the guards in Canada as if they, the internees, were actually German soldiers. One Austrian refugee who settled in Montreal, Edgar L., reports there being a gauntlet of hostile Quebec City residents. And what happened was we had to go through some streets. The population who thought that we were German prisoners of war were cursing us and spitting at us and throwing stones. It was a very hostile reaction by the populace. From the Quebec City gauntlet, the Jewish refugees from the MS Sobievsky were immediately sent to Trois-Rivières together with Nazi prisoners of war, believe it or not. Many different refugees report being serenaded with a particularly anti-Semitic song of the Nazi prisoners, the Horst Wessel song. One of them, all of a sudden, uh, looking down, uh, sees what was coming, and he yells to his friends and comrades, those are Jews. And as, some, as if somebody had given a command, they started to sing this hateful song, when the Juden blood from Messer spritzt, then it's noch mal so good. When the blood of the Jews drips from our knives, we feel twice as happy. Edgar S. reports that eventually the refugees were able to reason with their guards about the idiocy and danger of putting the Jews and Nazis together in the same camp. Yeah, so when, when we came to, to Three Rivers, uh, we, we, were, we were the majority, and uh, there would have been murder. And uh, we informed the, the Canadian, the Canadian uh, officers that it wouldn't work. So during the night, they, they put a barbed wire bet between us, and two days later, oh. the Germans were removed. Soon afterwards, Edgar and the others from the MS Sobieski were sent to New Brunswick to Camp B-70, or just Camp B for short. This camp was largely unfinished, and the refugees were expected to build the camp. Camp B had been used during the Great Depression as a relief camp. The internees first arrived at Camp B near Ripples, New Brunswick, which is about 30 kilometers from Fredericton, on August 12, 1940. They walked a long way from the train station to the camp. Life was pretty rough at first. Outhouses, six manned guard towers, and barbed wire. They were housed in army barracks and had to wear denim pants emblazoned with a red stripe and special jackets with a large target on the back to discourage those thinking about escaping. In every way, they were treated like prisoners despite never having committed a crime. Moreover, the refugees were expected to become lumberjacks in order to secure enough wood each day to heat the camp's stoves and cook the food. The internees, as one might imagine, were greatly ambivalent about their experiences. On one level, their lives were saved by the fact that England and then Canada took them out of harm's way. But on another level, most of them could not fathom why they were treated so abominably by the Canadian government, even after it was apparent who they were, and even after England and Churchill had acknowledged their error and was no longer interning such refugees from the Nazis in England. So the internees in Canada could not grasp why they were being prevented from helping to both integrate and build Canadian society. Many expressed the idea that they were afraid of the unknown, not knowing when or if the Canadian government would start making better decisions regarding their status. Some of the inmates of Camp B talk about there being a rich cultural life with a cafe run by the prisoners 
and occasional cultural performances, perhaps not so unlike those reported to have occurred in places like Theresienstadt or Westerbork. Among the internees were professors, doctors, scientists, Cambridge lecturers. Also, many of the prisoners became lifelong friends, and many chose to stay in Canada. Despite everything, it seems that some of the internees felt a sense of community. Ultimately, Edgar S. and many of the other internees were moved to other camps, including one in Sherbrooke, where he was finally released to work and live in Montreal in 1942. Remarkably, even after being released, Edgar S. and the others were still considered enemy aliens, and there was a consequence to this. When we were released, yeah. we were still enemy aliens, don't forget. Of course. So I had to report every you month did? to every month to to the RCMP. Mm -hmm. It was only after the war concluded that Edgar was finally permitted to normalize his status and become a Canadian citizen and bring his father over from France. In the end, it's hard not to view the treatment of the Jewish refugees generally as incredibly unnecessary and wasteful on the one hand, and rather callous and sensitive and utterly tone deaf on the other. Perhaps worst of all, Churchill's decision kept those with a true knowledge of how German society functioned from helping the Allies with the war effort. These were able-bodied young men who were excluded from the army for at least a couple of years in most cases. That ultimately is the reason that the policy made no sense in the end. Today, apparently, not much remains of Camp B. The government of the day clearly wanted to forget the whole matter. It was an unfortunate decision. Camp B is part of our history. Like it or not, we can't deny it. I hope you found this video enlightening. As always, thank you for watching.